They say that they are dangerous to man, that their power and hunting skills are to be feared. But if so, why do many people who encounter sharks tell a different story? How on earth can one animal be perceived in such contrasting ways? I'm Sarah Richmond, marine scientist, shark researcher and ocean conservationist. I'm fascinated by sharks and the role they play within the world's ecosystem. I'm going to take you on a journey around Australia, showing you some of the most diverse and amazing marine environments our great country has to offer. We'll be meeting shark experts, shark lovers, and coming face to face with lots of Australia's sharks. Join me as I experience the highs and lows of mankind's interactions with these wondrous creatures. Throughout this epic adventure, I will share with you the story of the shark and uncover the frightening truth about their fight for survival. Last time on Sarah Shark, we revealed what Queensland shark nets really look like and travelled to South Australia to meet the world's most infamous shark, the Great White. This episode, we start our adventure at Rainbow Beach. Rainbow Beach gets its name from the rainbow-coloured sand dunes surrounding the town. Originally a sand mining community, the town's economy is now heavily influenced by tourism. It's a popular destination amongst four-wheel drive enthusiasts and people who love the outdoor lifestyle. Just off the coast lies a dive site that is home to some really interesting sharks. The grey nose shark is the most critically endangered shark in Australia. The latest figures put numbers for the East Coast population down to as little as 1,500 individuals. So every area along the east coast of Australia, where these sharks can be found in numbers, should be considered critical habitat. This rock behind me is one of those habitats. I'm at Wolf Rock, which is a part of the Great Sandy Marine Park in Queensland. And I'm here to show you the resident grey nurse shark population. The dive site is made up of four volcanic pinnacles, forming deep gutters in which the sharks like to hang out. As we descend to the bottom, it's like floating down the side of a mountain. Wolf Rock is also home to many other species of fish, like batfish, snapper, kingfish, jewfish and sawtails. When I reach the bottom at about 30 metres, I spot my first grey nurse shark. Our dive guide Kevin has decades of experience diving here and put us straight onto the sharks. All of these sharks appear to be males and there's a pack of them patrolling the rock. Grey nurse sharks had a fearsome reputation in the past because of their protruding needle-like teeth. But this couldn't be any further from the truth. Their teeth are actually designed to pierce small fish, so a grey nurse will only eat prey small enough to swallow, much smaller than a diver. Each shark has a unique pattern of spots on its flanks. These are as unique as fingerprints and they are one way scientists can identify individual sharks. These sharks can grow to a length of 3.5 metres and are impressive animals to dive with, as they're very curious, often swimming right up to divers. There is a no fishing zone 1.5 kilometres around Wolf Rock, because it is part of the large Great Sandy Marine Park, which also includes Harvey Bay and the east coast of Fraser Island. We leave the males to continue our dive along to the other side of the rock, where the conditions have changed. The visibility has dropped slightly and there is a strong current running. Here in the murky channel, we find the females, which can be found at the rock all year. 
The males are only seasonal visitors, coming to Wolf Rock to mate in the summer months. I count six or seven females, and they're significantly larger than the males I've just encountered. I wish I could stay down with the sharks longer, but my dwindling air supply and dive computer signal it's time to head back to the surface. As I ascend, I spiral around the rock to try to get one more glimpse of the male sharks. On my way, I bump into an old man of the sea, a loggerhead turtle, who's quite happy to share the ocean with all the sharks. Kev, what's the protection status for Wolf Rock? Wolf Rock has had the greatest protection of any other grey nurse shark site on the east coast of Australia. Um, it was protected about seven years ago, even before it became a marine park. And how long have you been operating here? Uh, we've been here in Rainbow Beach full time for nearly 12 years. How big is the protection area around Wolf Rock? The sanctuary at Wolf Rock is actually 1.5 kilometres in a radius. 1.2 kilometres of that in a radius is an absolute no-take zone. There's a further 300 metres of uh, buffer zone where fishermen are allowed to troll. So Queensland, compared to places in New South Wales that, you know, these, this east coast population of grey nurse inhabit, there's major differences in with the protection status. Why do you think New South Wales is sort of so far behind Queensland? I think that because um, the population of uh, New South Wales um, being, you know, Sydney and surrounding satellite cities, the fishing lobby has uh, a lot of power. The protective zones around the grey nurse shark sites in New South Wales is only a 200 metre zone. Wow, that's, that's not much at all. Well, in essence, you can anchor your boat outside 200 metres and cast inside. Yep, OK. So they're not that effective then? No. So I hear you're a very good friend of Steve Irwin. That's right. Um, what's his, what was his feelings on the rock here? Steve was very passionate about Wolf Rock. He'd come and dive regularly up here with us and sometimes bring the whole family and we'd picnic on the beach. Um, being that Wolf Rock is the uh, most important site in Queensland and it's, uh, it's here on the uh, top end of the Sunshine Coast area, which is Steve's home. He was very passionate about it. The protection of grey nurse sharks, such as the no fishing zone around Wolf Rock, and divers like Kevin are essential to the recovery of this critically endangered species. Another location that's important to grey nurse sharks is situated 800 kilometres south, and it's at Southwest Rocks. I'm going to head down there and compare the two sites. While I'm on my way down, I'm going to stop off at my hometown on the Gold Coast to further investigate the selling of shark meat. In Australia, all shark meat is sold under the label Flake. Amongst the most popular are gummy shark, black tip shark and shovel nose, which despite being sold as a shark, is actually a type of ray. If you count the sharks occasionally sold as flake, including hammerhead, mako and wobbegong, the number of species increases to around 30. So why does it matter what kind of flake we buy? You have to look at the specific shark species and their individual reproductive stages. Let's compare gummy and scalloped hammerhead shark as an example. The gummy shark is classed as least concern on the IUCN's red list, while the hammerhead is endangered. Female gummy sharks reach reproductive age at about five years, much faster than the female hammerheads, which take about 15 years. Both sharks pup every two years. However, gummy sharks produce more young, giving birth to 20 to 50 pups, while scalloped hammerhead sharks can only give birth to around 15 to 30 pups. So over a lifespan of 25 years, based on the litter sizes, a female gummy shark could produce a maximum of 500 pups, while a female hammerhead could only give birth to a maximum of 150 pups. So if you still choose to eat flake, you should know what species you are buying. 
Sharks are a long-lived, late-maturing and slow-reproducing animal. I personally believe that all sharks are an unsustainable seafood choice. Now that I'm back home on the Gold Coast, I'm hitting the streets to find out what the public knows about flake. Do you know what flake is? Flake, yes, it's fish, but it's shark. No, I don't. It's, uh, you get it in fish and chip shop, but it's actually shark, isn't it? Yeah. Um, is that a part of the fish that's thinly sliced? I'm not quite sure. Have you eaten it before? No. Yes, I believe so. Yes. I have not. I, I think I have, yeah. yeah. No, I've never eaten it because it's shark. Do you know what species of shark it was? Not completely. No idea. No, I've never questioned it, but it's uh, been interesting to find out. Uh, particularly for the, uh, I don't know, the grey nurse and all that? No, I do not know. what. It's not advertised in the shop at all with species, no. So you'll continue to eat flake knowing that it's knowing that it's shark and you don't know what species it is? Um, that depends on what the answer could be. If it's maybe a protected species, maybe a totally different kettle of fish, yeah. So when we buy flake, how do we know what's really ending up on our dinner plates? I'm going into some of the Gold Coast's most popular seafood shops to see if they know where their flake comes from. Out of the 14 seafood shops I talked to, all but three could tell me what kind of flake they sold. Half of the shop sold black tip shark, while one also sold hammerhead. Two stores had shovel nose ray, and one shop said they do not sell any flake at all. Tune in to episode four, where we'll be getting mercury testing done on a range of seafood, including three types of flake. Located on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, Southwest Rocks is blessed by beautiful natural scenery, numerous beaches, and attractions such as the Trial Bay Jail and the Smoky Cape Lighthouse. This town is a must-visit destination for tourists. I decide I'm gonna do a little sightseeing before I go diving. I'm here at the Southwest Rocks Historic Jail, which was opened in 1886 as a works prison. Just four kilometers south and out to sea lies Fish Rock, which is the most important site for grey nurse sharks in New South Wales. Surprisingly, it's also the only critical habitat not protected as a marine park. What's even more worrying is the recent relaxation of important fishing restrictions that could make the grey nurse sharks more vulnerable. It's a beautiful day on the water at Fish Rock. The boat gives us a final bon voyage and it's time to embrace the cold water to go find the cave and some grey nurse sharks. Descending down, following our dive guide, Cassie, I check the water temperature and it's a chilly 17 degrees. The East Australian current comes very close to the rock. This fast moving current brings nutrients for lots of schooling fish to feed on. We've been in the water for two minutes and we see our first grey nurse shark. She's a beautiful two-metre female. As we get to the cave entrance, an eastern blue groper decides to pose for our cameras. These fish are protected in the state of New South Wales from all fishing. The entrance to the cave sits in about 24 metres of water. And although I'm an experienced diver, I can't help feeling a certain amount of anxious excitement. As I head into the narrow entrance, I'm swallowed by a school of shimmering bullseyes. And for a few seconds, all I can see are these tiny yellow fish. The cave starts off quite narrow, bringing me face to face with the fish life, which takes shelter here. The next thing I see stops me in my tracks. It's a huge wobbegong shark, one of the biggest I have ever seen with the remains of six rock lobsters the shark has eaten. I cautiously swim over the top of him and appear to hit a dead end. I turn around to signal to the other divers that we must be at the chimney. Th 
This is the part of the cave where we leave 24 metres and ascend to 14 metres, in the heart of the rock. It's pitch black in here, but as I move my torch around, I see that the cave has opened up and it feels less claustrophobic. I encounter another huge wobbegong and a big bull ray. As I turn a corner, a shaft of light appears and I know I'm coming to the end of the cave. The light shining through the water is a beautiful and welcoming sight. A protected black cod swims by and I stop just for a moment before I exit the cave to take in the view. As I exit the cave, I encounter another bull ray that leads me to a spot nicknamed the Aquarium. It's here I meet the sharks. It's important when diving with grey nurse sharks not to block their way. So divers follow a strict practice of keeping to the sides of gutters and channels, giving the sharks plenty of room to manoeuvre and avoid us if they so wish. As I leave the aquarium, I unfortunately spot what I've come here to witness. A grey nurse shark with some fishing gear caught in its mouth. These photographs from Pete Hitchens closer demonstrate the severe damage that fishing hooks and lines can have on grey nurse sharks. Seventy percent of all the dead grey nurse sharks which have been autopsied on the east coast of Australia were found to have fishing gear in their mouths, gills or inside their bodies. That makes sites like Fish Rock, where you find these sharks in numbers, critical habitats in need of protection from all types of fishing. Just as I'm about to end my dive, I encounter the biggest grey nurse shark I have ever seen. She looks to be about three metres in length, and she is awesome. My investigation into Flake showed me that there definitely needs to be better labelling of shark meat. I found it really surprising that so many people who buy Flake have no idea what kind of shark they are eating. One person even thought they had bought critically endangered grey nurse shark. I've taken you to two locations of outstanding beauty that are both essential to the survival of grey nurse sharks. On this journey, I believe I've shown you that grey nurses are the Labradors of the sea that deserve our respect and total protection. Diving with these beautiful, gentle creatures is a relaxing experience I wish everyone could enjoy. After Nelly being wiped out 40 years ago, this population is still struggling to recover. However, with the right resources, proper management and better education, the future of the East Coast population of grey nurse sharks remains hopeful. This could all be possible if we could just learn to share the seas.